human mind and, and what motivates us. In particular, I was fascinated by, uh, by disagreement, as odd as it might sound. I was fascinated by the way that the people who knew each other very well could argue, uh, and from the outside, often about utterly meaningless, trivial things. Uh, a huge disagreement, to the point where marriages would fail, relationships would break down. And uh, in the hospital environment, physical fights would often break out uh, when you added in those extra dimensions of, uh, of loss, bereavement, uh, pain and anguish. So as an observer to this, I was kind of interested, in how can we get things so wrong? Around about the same time I saw a magician, uh, it was actually David Blaine, for those of you who recognise the name, uh, it had his first TV special that aired in the UK on Channel 4, and that's nearly 25 years ago. And he, uh, he presented magic, and it was unlike anything we'd ever seen before here in the UK. Magic up until that point was always around the performer, uh, when you think about, for those of you old enough to go all the way back to uh, David Nixon. <laughs> so, so one person's old enough. Thank you. Uh, uh, I wonder if I'm going to get any kids when I mention Paul Daniels. Ooh. <laughs> a decidedly uh, a cooler response. Now what was interesting was that Blake came along and suddenly magic was about the people. The camera was not focused on him and what he was doing. It was focused on the reaction of the audience. Uh, and I was captivated by this. There was one particular magic trick that he performed. Um, I, I, I have to understand at this stage in my life, uh, I was 20, whatever, uh, I had zero interest in magic. I had no childhood fascination with the subject at all. Uh, I knew how to hold a pack of cards from playing simple games with friends, but that was the extent of my knowledge. And I watched this one particular trick. I remembered it, you know, bearing in mind we're back in the days of VHS, Explain that later. <laughs> so, as a, as a slight aside, uh, my, my eight year old son came home from school, uh, this is maybe about a year or so ago, he came home and he said, um, as, as always, that car journey home, what did you learn to say at school? And usually his reply is, nothing. Yeah, it's amazing how little they learn at school these days. Um, yeah. uh, but on this occasion, he said, oh, Daddy. We learnt about these things called record players. <laughs> right? Yeah. They, they, they made sound. Okay. What lesson did you learn that in? History. <laughs> so I immediately went out and bought myself some tweed uh, slippers uh, <laughs> and a smoking jacket. Um, uh, so, I don't know, well, I, don't know. Well, I told you, I warned you, I was going to wander off in weird flights of fancy. Um, so, uh, but yeah, David Blake, uh, magic tricks. So I went out and I bought a pack of cards. It, there was only one trick that I remembered from, from uh, watching it on, on television. You know, no ability to pause and rewind and store on a on mobile device at that stage, of course. Uh, and I just remember this one card trick. And on a train journey from London down to Bournemouth, I sat there and I worked out how to do this trick. Uh, and I showed it to my father when I got home. My father's a you know, very sort of sceptical human being. He's, 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 a, uh, he's a tradesman, or at least he was a tradesman. He was a carpenter back in the day. So he's got that kind of analytical mind. Uh, he's not really disposed to uh, emotional outbursts. But his response to this was, he went, wow, that's astonishing. My expectation, of course, that he would do the fatherly thing of going, oh, that was very good, well done, little boy, even though I was 20 something. Um, but he was astonished by it. And that gave me this little bug. Now, now what did, what, how I differed from many people who maybe were learning magic as children is that rather than starting off by learning sleight of hand, and then finally, as time went on, understanding the principle behind it, the psychology of it, I'd gone the other route. I understood why magic worked before I understood how magic worked, which kind of gave me a different edge to the whole thing. As time went on, I added uh, other skill sets. Uh, I added pickpocketing, which might sound like a terribly nefarious skill, uh, but actually there's not a huge amount of difference between the mechanics of, uh, or rather the, the 
sort of the psychological mechanics of magic and the way that pickpocketing works. And I'll talk about that in more detail as we go on. And then I added hypnosis. Now this is where something slightly odd happened. <coughs> Uh, and I need to kind of give you this background information before we progress on. I hope you will bear with me. Um, one of the things about magic, and I apologize in advance for bursting any belief bubbles here in the room this evening. It's not real. <laughs> it's all a great big lie. Uh, but magic is a fun thing, and it's about our perception, it's about playing around with. Uh, the preconceived ideas of what can and cannot happen. It's about uh, altering the perceptions of people, uh, feeding in information and uh, withholding other pieces of information, and letting your brain do a wonderful job of constructing a narrative uh, which is designed to lead you up the garden path. But one of the great things about magic, for me, is it taught me the idea uh, that... Uh, small time to swear in permitted? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it taught me a little principle which I kind of took on in other areas of my life, which was uh, uh, the, the acronym is TCBB. TCBB. And it's something I'd like to remind myself of uh, every time I see something that appears on the surface to be incredible in any way. And TCBB stands for this could be bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> this could be bullshit, depends on how you prefer. Because one of the things about magic is that you realize that the, the perceived explanation is often vastly different to the reality. Now there are certain phrases that, that have fallen into common uh, parlance which are wildly inaccurate. And within magic, the, the, the one phrase that is used all the time is, uh, the hand is quicker than the eye. <coughs> no. No, it isn't. Never has been, never will be. But it kind of serves a purpose to continue a narrative that we like to use in the notes. <coughs> Another concept is the idea of seeing is believing. No, that's not true either. <laughs> and we'll go on to why that might be uh, as, we, as we develop this. But as a magician, I learned that the explanation given. So if I do if I do a magic trick, and I tell you how the magic trick is done. You can be pretty much certain in your mind that the explanation is actually part of the trick. The explanation of how I did the trick serves one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to steer you even further away. <laughs> Not close. And this is a common thing that's used by magicians, uh, particularly it's used by mentors, the area of magic which is uh, supposed to mimic the concept of mind reading or telepathy or ESP. And, and uh, in, in, in today's uh, world, uh, which is sort of, I, I won't say skeptic heavy, uh, but there is a, 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 a sort of a, a, an edge of, of skepticism which is in the mainstream more and more, uh, or arguably less and less in the last five years, but that's a totally different discussion. Um, the, the, the idea of uh, all, all magic being explained because I'm using psychology mind reading, body language, etc. So let me give you a, a quick explanation, or a quick demonstration rather. <coughs> very, very simplistic. We're not going to dwell too much on this kind of nonsense. Uh, but I'm going to look right away over here. Generally, I am. Uh, if you can shut this if you want to, it's not a waste of time. But you can if you desire. <laughs> and all of that might have just been a lie, to be honest. Okay. Uh, Any way you like to say stop for me? Go to that part. Cars, yes? Could you just take them off and shuffle them? Make sure there's no way I can know what or where the car is. Now, as we did that, genuinely I was in the way, yes? Yes. Yes? Uh, is there any way that I could have like, used a reflection or anything to see what that car was? Are you happy, for the people who were sat closest, that that was fair? If you want me to do it again, we'll try and make it even fairer. Maybe some of you can come and cover my eyes. If that's... No, are we happy? Okay, so, uh, you have a card in mind. Do you remember? Yes, yes. okay, that's good. Don't need these. Can... Over there. Uh, what's your name? Holly. Would you be kind enough to stand up for me, Holly? Just it makes it a lot easier to to see to see the whole of you. I need to turn slightly this way. Uh, place your hands out like so. Rest them on mine. Just rest them. Just give them the weight of your arms. That's it. Just hang on a minute. There, there we have it. Take a nice deep breath in. 
Okay, we're going to ask you some questions, a bit like 20 questions. I don't want you to say anything at all. I just want you to think of the answers. Think of the answers, okay? So we're going to start from nice and easy, uh, because we can whittle it down to choices. So, for example, the obvious one would be whether your card was a red card or a black card, and you could think now which one it is. And very much as you think this, I want you to associate it with something. So say, for example, if it was a red card, I want you to think of something really happy, really joyful. If it was a black card, I want you to think of something slightly darker, uh, maybe... Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now, now we're going to move on to the next stage, which is whether it's a heart or a head. Okay? So just so you can try not to give anything away. Okay. And this time, I just want you to think, um, you know, the, the idea of the heart being right, and the diamond could be left over there. Okay, so just the heart is right. Diamond is left with the weight of that heart. Thank you. Okay. Um, and finally, we, oh no, no, we can narrow it down to maybe uh, colours and uh, colours and picture cards. So, uh, sorry, numbers and picture cards. Um, and that's all I needed. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Jack, Queen, King, or no, Jack, Queen, or King. And we'll go for the King of Hearts. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now clearly you can all see what I was doing. I'm, 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 I'm taking the weight, I'm feeling the different, the, the differences in the, in the weight of the muscles, or what's called muscle reading. Uh, I'm feeling the pulse, I'm getting a sense of, uh, you know, by asking questions I can kind of judge responses, reactions. Uh, when I make small statements, which kind of sound like I'm making statements, but they're kind of really questions. I'm seeing the way that she responds to those questions, like a little bit of laughter that gives something away. Yes, you can all see all of that. Yes? Yeah? Yes. No. <laughs> no, I just, I just have a method of knowing what card she picks. <laughs> From the start, I knew that it was the King of Hearts. Like, literally right before she knew it was the King of Hearts, I already knew it was the King of Hearts. And the rest of it is simply designed to feed in to your expectations, to the things that you'd want to see. I have an audience here who I'm going to assume, because of this, a slightly more of a sceptical nature, a slightly more questioning of the world that we live in. Uh, that that things, things need to feel like there's a, there's a rationale to it. So of course I'm going to give you exactly what you need. You're still astonished by it, it's still good magic, but I'm feeding into your designs. However, if this said, I deep uh, association for generally woolly beliefs <laughs> um, and tarot, I would, um, sorry, no offense to anybody who likes to play in the cards. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if I was dealing with people who had those sorts of beliefs, then, then, this, then this, the, the, the expression of the way that I read that may well have been much, much more about spiritual signals, things that I was picking up on. Yeah? Um, it could have just been direct ESP. You know, if, if I felt that, that, that I could get away with the power dynamic here, that I could actually be the one in control, almost the witch doctor effect. Then it would be it would be done by burning into the person's soul. But the but the point I'm making here is that the explanation for how it's done does not necessarily add up to how it's done. Now you step you take one step back from this, you know, kind of a slightly slightly meta uh, uh, level of this. It does not take as much as you might think for the practitioner of this to equally believe the lie in the mechanism. If I've been taught how to do something, and the, the explanation of how it works was, a, was, was either a lie or, or, or it, it was just untrue, whether purposely untrue or accidentally untrue, it doesn't take much for me to then continue that process down the line. And that's precisely what happened when I started to learn hypnosis. I looked at hypnosis, and as a magician, I felt very, very distinctly from day one the explanation to, uh, as to what was happening was precisely the level of explanation I would give as a magician. It sounded like a lie. It worked, don't get me wrong, I knew it worked, 
But why it worked didn't seem to make sense to me. And the reason it didn't make sense to me was that, uh, uh, I don't know how much people know about hypnosis, but let's go for a very classical view of hypnosis, which is um, this, uh, this mechanical arrangement of, uh, it's typified with the idea of looking my eyes sleep deeper and deeper. The idea uh, uh, which, which I was originally taught was that what the hypnotist does by various means of focus um, uh, it is, is, that, is that we bypass the critical faculties of the human mind and we access the subconscious to give direct suggestions or indirect suggestions. And ideally this is manifest by placing the person into a trance. And the depth of said trance is important. The deeper the person goes, the more suggestible that they become. And to do this, I require fairly intricate uh, rituals to take place. That I might do a classic uh, Bandler, uh, uh, Richard Bandler style uh, handshake induction, where as I, as I reach out to take the person's hand, just as their expectation of a handshake is about to, uh, uh, to, uh, to happen, I break the pattern. I do a pattern interruption by suddenly taking their hand and elevating it in front of their face. And then I give them some suggestive language and I guide them into a deep state of trance. The, the words I use and the way I construct those words is of vital importance. Vital importance. And the tone that I use, as if I've been a DJ on Hush FM for the last 20 years. That's right. As you go deeper and deeper. Calling out all the truckers. <laughs> um, but the problem is, as a magician, with this, this brain that I have for illusion, something was wrong. Something felt deeply <coughs> wrong in all of this. Because at its heart, that model of hypnosis required me to accept and believe the hypnosis was about spells and rituals. Because if the argument here is that hypnosis takes place because I use the right words in the right order with the right tone, that is the definition of a verbal spell. If I say that I have to work through a particular set of very precise gestures and rituals, well those are rituals. So the idea that this thing called hypnosis was about spells and rituals. And as a magician, I know that spells and rituals are bollocks. They don't exist. There's something else going on and that something else does exist, has benefit, has merit but we need to understand what it is. So there's the, the brief overview. Oh, what's the time, by the way? I need to have a vague idea. What time did we start? Just keep going. If I, if I start seeing people drifting off into a deep trance, <laughs> that will not reflect well on me. Um, okay, so, uh, what I want to try and get across to you this evening, and this is kind of the, 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 the background, is that we are all sold on a lie from a fairly early age and it's part of the way that our brains are constructed, part of the way that we learn and that is quite a profound lie I think and that is that uh, reality is something that you objectively observe. And my argument to you this evening is that reality is entirely a subjective experience. And the more we understand about the subjective experience, the more we can actually begin to relate to one another, understand one another, learn where each other comes from, and actually progress. I've been a great observer in the last 10 years of the, the changes in, in the social dynamic of the world, and the changes in the politics of the world. And I'm, I'm deeply, deeply concerned with where everything is currently going. We're becoming more and more uh, 
polarized in our views and our opinions. Uh, the, the, the generations that are coming on after us are becoming less and less able to be challenged, to be questioned, to think beyond their small bubble of reality. And I think there's some deep, deep dangers uh, in all of this. I think it's also interesting that part of this dynamic and part of this, this problem of, of this belief that we are objectively right in what we, what we think is that uh, this polarization takes place, that if you are not literally where I am, if you, are any, if you are anywhere to the left of me, in my mind you are now as far left as you can get. If you're anywhere to the right of me, in my mind you are as far right as you can get. And this is terribly, terribly dangerous. And dialogue, discussion, debate, analysis of our shared experiences becomes uh, harder and harder. In fact, I would argue that it's become impossible uh, at, any, at any practical level. Um, so, the very brief, very easy to understand, I hope, the illusion of reality is this. That reality comes to us via our senses, this wonderful brain of mine is able to uh, take in all of that information with uh, relative clarity, uh, the illusion being 100% clarity, uh, and then I make objective decisions based upon what I observe, what I, what I feel, what I smell, what I see, all those sorts of things. And this is the illusion that we live in. Science, on the other hand, tells us something decidedly different. Science tells us that the process is much more like this. Uh, oh, by the way, just, just for context sake, I'm going to, some of the words I used this evening, I'm going to refer to the uh, to, uh, consciousness, or conscience, uh, and what I mean by that, and I might, I might swap that word for uh, awareness, and I, I personally prefer the term awareness. And I'm not going to use the word subconscious, because I think it's a very bad descriptor of what kind of understand about, the, 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 about this part of the mind, uh, I shall simply use the word non-awareness. So I think we have a sense of awareness and we have non-awareness. And the, the awareness is fairly self-explanatory. It's the stuff that you are aware, cerebrally, of what you do and why you do it and what goes on. And the non-awareness is everything else. And the non-awareness is the one that's doing pretty much everything. And science shows us that what happens is that stuff, not everything, in fact very little, realistically speaking, uh, uh, some of what we do filters up to the awareness after the fact where we can analyze, justify, rationalize what, what our experience is. Uh, there's a very famous test for this, uh, which is very simply the idea of uh, people giving paddles, if since we've had fMRI scans we can do these things, uh, people were given paddles, brain was wired up, uh, there was a stimuli, I think if memory serves correctly, it was a, a light flashed on, and the instruction was, when you see the light come on, make a decision, you either depress the right or the left button. Very simple. Now, because of the way we can map the brain, uh, what they showed us was that when the light came on, and I went, I will press the right button, the part of my brain that lights up like a little Christmas tree when I have that awareness thought, is fired off significantly after the part of my brain that operates this. Significantly after. Every time. Without fail. To the point of uh, the, the people monitoring these tests could actually, actually knew which button the person would press before the person was aware that they were going to press that button. Okay? A bit trippy in the way that you think, but this is how your mind works. It's still you. Let's be very clear about this. There's no puppet master going on in the background. It's still you. But it's just not happening in the way that you perceive. Reality itself comes in by your senses. But what you experience bears little resemblance to the data that came in. Let's take your eyes as a simple example of this. Right now, you all appear to be able to see all that you can see. That your experience is that your eyes are seeing everything in front of you. But if you've got a rudimentary knowledge of the human eye, you know that that's not the case. Your eye can only see a very small amount of that data that comes in. 
In, 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 in one moment, you understand. So we'll come to that in a second. So, uh, moment by moment, you write only see a small amount. And in simplistic terms, basically, you write and focus on about the size of a 10p, right, that people take. It has outer focus about a dinner plate, and then it has pretty much bugger all else. It's also upside down. It's also in bits. It's not one clear image. It's happening in, in, in tiny little pieces of information. <coughs> and what happens is your eye scans around, uh, moves around sort of at least four times a minute or something, you, you scan without really realizing that you're doing it. And what the brain does is it just every, it literally, moment to moment, approximately a second after happening, your brain creates an image based upon the data it already has. Not on what is, but on the data it already has. And you fill out this experience that we call vision. Sound is the same. There's a great test on YouTube that demonstrates this. It's one of my favorite demonstrations. Uh, a little audio clip is played uh, to the audience, and it sounds like garbled nonsense. And no matter how many times the audience listens to this uh, four-second sound clip, just, I mean, nothing. People can wildly speculate as to what might be, and everybody seems to pick out different words that they think that they can hear. And then the presenter gives them a sentence, and the one that I've got, the sentence is, I think Brexit is a terrible idea. Um, but now you play the original sound clip again. It's exactly the same piece of input. And now all of a sudden, you can hear with clarity that sentence. And it now doesn't matter how long a gap between you next hearing that sound wave, you will still hear that sentence again. You can now no longer not hear that sentence. What do we learn from this? And that is, it is more about what I already know than it ever is about what information comes in. All right? So our experience of reality is that information comes through my senses. It is very bitty. It's very much dictated upon where my focus is at any given time, which in turn is, is all about what my beliefs and expectations are and my prejudices are. So information comes in through my senses. Uh, senses. It goes into uh, my, my, my non-awareness, where it is filtered beautifully through a set of biases that I already have based on my beliefs and pre-experiences. And that, that then forms this wonderful loop, uh, this cognitive loop of bias, where some stuff filters up to my awareness, where I can just go, yes, that's exactly what I expected to happen. And then it can go back down and strengthen my bias. Some stuff is just ignored altogether because it really doesn't fit well with my narrative of life. And then what comes out is my subjective view of reality. But the illusion for me is always one of objectivity. The illusion is so strong, unbelievably powerful. And until we start to think about it from that point of view, we are forever going to be trapped in this perpetual routine of uh, illusion. Um, very quickly, a, a little brief picture of this, uh, what me and my business partner call the, the human OS system. Oh, the human OS, not OS system, that's... Uh, or humanos, uh, as he refers to it. So, uh, we have this very simplistic view, uh, so it's a nice little top-down view if you like, that we have a brain that has evolved over a long period of time with lots of stuff going on with regards to that evolution uh, of the human brain. Uh, unfortunately, evolution is a very slow process and human expansion, human evolution if you like, on, on that technological side has suddenly rocketed off at a mighty pace and human biological evolution hasn't had time to catch up on an awful lot of this stuff. So let me give you just a, a quick example of this. 
the, uh, the body's uh, fight or flight response, the adrenal system. The adrenal system is relatively well documented and most people agree upon this. Uh, it, it, the fight or flight system is, 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 a, is a system which can, it's just about bypassing, overthinking everything. It utterly stems back from a much earlier time in our human history where threat was real and it was, it was every day. And the idea being to take it back to the kind of caveman style imagery, uh, woolly mammoth, uh, forget the timeline of whether woolly mammoth is at the same time. Uh, uh, woolly mammoth uh, came out of the underbush and uh, the, the, the human brain had to very quickly make a decision to either stand and fight said mammoth or run like hell. And the adrenal system just powers you for a short burst of time to give you that extra boost to get the hell out of dodge or to, to fight harder than you thought before. Great little system. Jump forward a few thousand years, not quite so good. Because all of a sudden now, we have an, an, an adrenaline response to the idea of standing up and talking in public. Just think about that for a second. People will say, and performers especially, will say, so by the way, that feeling of sickness you get in your stomach, that, that, that churning sensation, uh, yeah, pre-nerves thing, um, it, there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that that is almost entirely uh, adrenaline uh, that is being kicked into action and then not used. And as it just kind of uh, does nothing, you end up with that horrible sick sensation in your stomach. Yeah? But why did you have an adrenal response in the first place? There was no mammoth going to kill you. There was no requirement to run or to stand and fight. So there's something off with that system. So the very basic picture that we have here is that you uh, you have, you have this, <coughs> this deep need for survival. And that deep need for survival, and the way that our brain it, uh, is, it, it operates, is that we want to make sense of the world uh, as quickly as we possibly can. And one of the ways that we do that is that we create beliefs. We create structures of beliefs to simplify the world ahead of us. So we have an experience, we create a belief around it, and the belief is an if-then concept. If this, then that. Very, very simple. And if it works once, we just go, right, we'll install that as an app and we'll simply run that program the next time. And it's not something that you have awareness of, it's done completely in the, in the level of non-awareness. And if it's not challenged, it just continues on. And so that builds and it builds and it builds. There's a big flaw to that, and that is most of what we believe is a lie. It's just not true. And this now causes us huge, huge problems. It's not just problematic in the sense that you bend your own reality and you, you, you confirm your bias, you confirm your, your belief, your prejudice, you ignore evidence to the contrary, and we all do it. And if anybody here, and I want to be really stressed, I want to really stress this point. Anybody here who thinks, oh, I'm not like that because I have a scientific mind. And I question myself about everything. And I would argue that your delusion is as strong as the person you're laughing at for that very reason. So be cautious about those things. And we all, we all do it. We all live in these little thought bubbles. We gravitate to it at anything that supports what we believe. We do our best to ignore what we don't. We work with these biases on multiple levels. You do it with the people you listen to. If you, if you were to attend, um, I like this because it's, it's, it's kind of politically here at the moment. If you, uh, if you got a, a, a room full of Trump supporters, uh, Trump could get up and speak for an hour and say nothing but lies, and the audience would believe most of what he said. The same audience could have Obama give a talk which was 100% uh, factually accurate and they wouldn't believe a word of it. And the decision is not based at any level on the information that they are hearing. The decision was made in advance of the input. That's very important to understand. 
And we have that in so many levels of what we as human beings do. When you read some information, more often than not, you've already decided whether you believe it or not before you've read it. And the act, of, the act of you doing this is to simply confirm what you already knew to be true. And we do this with input coming in, but we also do it on this internal level of self-belief. The doubts, the fears, the uncertainties that we have. We ignore any evidence that puts those, those concepts into question because it's against our survival instinct to do it. It's so much easier to never go back to that watering hole again because when we were last there, a lion killed my friend. And it, and it is to understand that that was a one-off event. Or maybe if I just went the other side of, of the lake, I would be away from the danger. We don't think like that because it's against our deepest survival, our first level uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs uh, 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 part. It, I think it, comes, it becomes even more critical when we are in a position where we're allowing other people to manipulate what we think and what we believe. And that's pretty much what my life is about. On a very superficial level, more often than not, I'm just doing it for entertainment purposes. I'm inviting you into this, this world where you, will, where you give me permission uh, to toy with, with your perception of reality for a time, and then you go back to your normal world afterwards. But there's a very small step that I'd have to take to actively manipulate. A very small step. And sometimes time is all that's required. Uh, a few years ago for a TV special uh, that was aired in Germany, uh, a group of us uh, took uh, two groups of people. Uh, one group who'd answered the ad saying that they firmly believed in ghosts and the supernatural, and another group who absolutely said, nope, it's all bollocks. It took us four days to get that second group of people to experience a ghost in, in, a, in a deeply profound, life-changing, scared the hell out of them sort of way. Yeah. And again, there's that little part of your brain, maybe, that little bias that you have that's saying something like, I'd never fall for that. <laughs> yeah, you would. Um, Mike, can you just play that? In the bathroom, uh, there's a little box of tissues on the, on, the, on the sink. Could you grab those for me, if you like? Thank you. Um, so I want to demonstrate this uh, in, in, in a couple of ways for you, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap things up with some questions. I, I've thrown lots of kind of stuff at you. My brain works at a weird level of just stream of consciousness. I hope you don't mind. I, I hope you've got something of interest from it. But I want to, I want to demonstrate a couple of things for you. Uh, the first one is, um, has anybody got a two-pound coin, by the way? Has anybody got a two-pound coin? Just went up here and retrieve said box. Hey, hang on. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. What's your name? Lisa, would you be kind enough to come and help me with something? I promise I will be really lovely and delicate, gentle, and wonderful. And you're always so lovely. And people, by the way, will spontaneously clap. <laughs> Okay, uh, for those of you at the back who may not be able to see this, I apologise. What I want to do is I just want to show you a couple of things very quickly, which is again, just I want to, I'm playing around with the idea of perception, the expectations that people have of what they think, or not what they think, but what they can actually suggest. What was it again, sorry, Ken? Lisa, okay. So we're going to start with something, something nice and simple. If I just rub and squeeze, it looks like the coin is a yes? Did you see it go? Uh, oh. yeah. No, 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 it's fine. That's fine. So this is, no, no, this is, sorry, what do you have? this is just a little test. So now this time, it's much easier to see, yes? No? <laughs> <laughs> so what we do then, so I'll explain this. What we do, I just don't pull it for me. So what we do is this, number one, we set up expectation. So I do something which is really obvious, which I know that she'll see. Because she's looking here, which means she absolutely can see my hand travel back, and she can see me put the coin in my pocket. There's no illusion there, there's nothing to hide whatsoever. First time round. Second time round, we just do something different. 
But the expectation that she has means that she's still looking in the wrong place. And there is no, there is no possibility for her brain to then fill those gaps in. For her, it's just gone. And it's not until she finally looks up here that she can see what's gone on. Yeah? Now, the other thing, I mean, obviously, you've, you've seen her. Oops. Uh, you've seen a coin fall up before, yes? <laughs> I'll do that again and get a little bit more high for you. Um, you can have to get a pocket hat hat towards me. Uh, we'll place this one up here. If I could push the coin up through one hand, all the way up through the other, so it's on top. <laughs> Perfect. 
Okay, right. Very quickly, just relax. I'm not going to do anything to you. I won't steal it down. Um, right now, I'm outside of your personal space. Yes? Okay. So as I come closer to you, I'm still outside of your personal space. I'm still outside. I'm just on the edge of your personal space. And I'm now inside. Yes? Yeah. And you can fulfill that sense of wanting to pull back slightly and the discomfort, but now I'm on the edge again. Mm -hmm. And now I'm away in safe. Take okay, next two steps. All good. Uh, can I get you to turn around, folks? Can you turn there for me? Can I get you to place that? Like Perfect. Can I hold your hand? I want you to look at the little cross in the center of your hand just there. Have you got it? Perfect. Just stand there. Okay. Take your breath. And just put your hands inside. You can just put your hand down. Did you at any level feel uncomfortable just then? But anywhere as much as when I walked towards you? No? But notice the difference. As I walked towards her, I was a metre away, half a metre away, and she felt uncomfortable. This time I literally had my arm around you, I was leaning into you, our bodies were touching pretty much from the floor up here, and you only felt a little bit uncomfortable. That doesn't make sense, does it? Except for the fact that I gave you instructions, and you had you had some focus. It also was because we didn't have eye contact. So when I came, so from here we've got eye contact, and that's really uncomfortable. All we do is I just lose eye contact. I just literally come underneath this radar that you have, and now as long as we have a shared point of focus, you don't feel the same sense. Thank you very much. As a pickpocket, what I'm doing is I'm playing around with your sense of awareness. I'm dipping in and out under, underneath your radar. I'm conditioning you to the touch and the experiences that you have. And I'm also utilizing the fact that your body purposefully ignores as many sensations it, as it possibly can. Or rather, it doesn't allow them up to your awareness. Because if it did, they would drive you mad. As an example, until I mention it, none of you are aware of the sensation of your underwear. <laughs> and now you all are. <laughs> Don't worry, that moment will pass. <laughs> That's the point, if it was always flooding up to your awareness, it would drive you mad. You'd, you'd just be driven nuts by your body rubbing against clothes all the time. So as long as we can just keep it down in that sense of unawareness, we can bypass all of those things, and I can manipulate, I can steal your watch, I can steal your wallet, I can steal the tie from around your neck, and the belt that you are wearing. And if you are one of those people who thinks, I'd never fall for that, we call you a mark. <laughs> um, two, uh, I've got time to, yeah, uh, two more very quick demonstrations, one small one, and then we'll get to the, the, the big fun one. Uh, who here is really attentive? <laughs> Who here is terrified of answering that question? <laughs> Perfect. Would you be kind enough to have a little sit just about there? You could walk across, you don't have to fall, it's fine. Um, no, 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 no. Um, can I get you to hold on to that? It's fine. Now, before I do this, are you aware of the trick with the paper ball? Perfect. Perfect. And I need to lean forward just to perform a play. Can you see this clearly? So before I do this, you're all going to see this. I'll be very clear, you're all going to see this. So clear, you can see that then. I'm going to place it into my hand, close my hand, close my hand around it, give a little wave, and the ball will vanish. Okay? Yeah, but come close to me. I'm going to place it into the hand, give it a little wave. <laughs> Like that, a little squeeze, and the ball will bounce. Did you see it go? No. no, we'll do it again. We'll do it from here. 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 We'll we'll That's it. Nice and close. So I'm going to roll it into a ball. It's going to go into my hand. Make sure you can see this. Give it a little rub. Give it a squeeze. We'll do it one more time. <laughs> one more time, make it a little bit bigger. <laughs> okay, so now, there's no way we can do it with that. If 
because that's just too big, isn't it? Too big, yeah?
Okay, so for that, uh, if, you, if you don't want to join in, just don't join in. Simple as that. There's no, there's no magic spell going on. I'm going to give you some information, I'm going to give you some ingredients, and I'm going to invite you to play this game. If you choose to play this game, fantastic. If you choose not to, I don't care. I don't care. It's not a problem. Right, so here's the instructions very, very simply. If you want to play the game, just find something to look at because we are going to take advantage of a little bit of focus, a bit of expectation, uh, and also, shortly, a little bit of fatigue in the eyes. So if you want to play a game, find a spot behind me on the wall and choose something to look at. Uh, all I want you to do now is I want you to just, uh, just imagine, and when I say imagine, I don't just mean think, I mean feel and experience. Allow the full sense of your senses to kick in, to create the illusion for yourself, which is what we're after here. I want you to think about the idea of your eyelids being heavy, the sensation of heavy eyelids. Maybe this is because you remember a time when you felt really tired and it was hard to keep them open. Uh, maybe right now you could just imagine them feeling heavy. So right now imagine your eyelids feeling heavy, allow them to feel even heavier still, and keep imagining them getting heavier until they close. Just allow them to close down when you can imagine them feeling heavy. And I'm not doing this to you, remember, I'm simply inviting you to do it yourself. Any of you who are still staring with your eyes open, you're just fighting yourself for no noticeable reason <laughs> at all. Okay. So right now, uh, you should, just because you're allowing yourself to think and feel something, you should allow your eyes to close. And now I want you to continue imagining them getting even heavier still, and even heavier still, all the way to a point where you can't lift them. Imagine your eyes, uh, your eyelids right now are so heavy that you can't lift them. Imagine not being able to lift them. And imagine not having any way to break out of that, that they are so heavy that you can't lift them and there's nothing you can do about it. And when you're sure, when you're certain you can't lift them, try and lift them and find you can't. And no matter how hard you try, they just stick blue lock way down tighter and tighter. Really try, genuinely try as hard as you possibly can to open your eyes. Right now, if you cannot open your eyes and you're genuinely trying, just lift your hand into the air so I can see. Just raise your hand really trying, that's it, that's perfect. And now simply stop imagining that you can't open them, and they'll just open. Just imagine you can open them easily and clearly, and your eyes should all get them. Yes, and you'll be still with their eyes shut, because they weren't listening. <laughs> perfect. Uh, the chap right in front of me in the blue, your name is? Jonathan. Jonathan, the crowd will go wild and cheer and applaud as you come up. Please don't worry. bigger than I was expecting. Yeah. That's the whole perception thing going on. Uh, Jonathan, if I need to stand facing the front with your feet shovel width apart. Clearly. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just put your hands by your side. Right, so a couple of things that are really important. Number one, uh, you're not going to uh, be made a fool of, nothing bad is going to happen. And most importantly, you're going to remain aware of everything. At no point will I be asking you to close your eyes. Uh, or if I did, it would just simply be to stop distractions. You're, you're going to have the ability to converse, uh, to do everything that you would normally do. Okay? Uh, and just start to place this foot forwards to about here. About there. That's perfect. And just soften the knee. Don't bend it too much. Just soften it. That's fine. And just look straight down at your foot. Wonderful. Don't take your eyes off your foot for a moment. I want you to take a nice deep breath in. And as you breathe out, I want you to start to imagine that foot feeling heavy, just in the same way that your eyes felt heavy and the blue foot getting heavier and heavier. You feel that, can't you? You can have it still until it completely sticks. Try and find that you can't, and the more you try, the more it sticks and it's really bright. Don't pretend, genuinely try as hard as you can, try and lift that foot, and it utterly sticks, blues and locks tighter and tighter and tighter. Genuinely try. Now you're perfectly awake. Yeah, you can speak to people, you can lift your head up and sort of wave your arms around and there's no weird trance-like sensations, but that foot is utterly blue and stuck to the floor, yes? Now the other foot isn't blue, you can lift the other foot up. 
Yep, that's perfect. Uh, for any of you who are watching this and you're just thinking, hey, that's just some kind of postural trick, center of gravity and all that, which you could well be thinking, and you wouldn't be wrong to think it necessarily. But that won't account for the fact that this foot here is now also stuck to the floor. So both feet are stuck and glued and locked, trying to dive with them and find that you can't. Really try, genuinely try and just dive with the foot. I mean, you're, you're a big, strong guy, and I want you to really give it some play. Try as hard as you can. Now, the heels and the toes could stick twice as hard now, like they were anchored down, like cemented into the ground, and you can feel that there. Really try and lift them. I find that they were even more stuck this time. In fact, ten times as stuck as they were the first time. Again, some of you might simply be thinking, well, maybe it's still just a postural trick. But that won't count for the fact that this hand here is stuck to his head. In the same way that his feet are stuck, his hand sticks tighter and tighter, the fingers stick, the thumb sticks. In fact, the entire palm of the hand glues, locks, and sticks even tighter. And the more he tries to move his hand, the more it sticks. Try it and find it sticks even more. Now, I don't know whether the feet stick more than the hand, or the hand sticks more than the head. It kind of doesn't matter to me at all. But they're all stuck up, they don't. Yeah, they are. <laughs> now, I can move the hand easily, look, but if I put it back, it locks 10,000 times as tight. Now, he really does try and lift it this time, but still he can't. Really try it. Yeah, and it sticks even more. Now, is it the finger stuck more than the palm, or the palm stuck? Finger stuck more. And all we have to do to stick the palm down is just give him a piece of narrative, like the palm sticks there. Even tighter than the fingers, or the fingers tighter than the palm. Either way around, the hand is stuck. Try and move it and find that you can't. It's even more. Tighter and tighter and tighter. And you're wide awake. Yeah, I mean, really importantly, you're not hypnotized right now, are you? But, I mean, do, you feel, do you feel like you're in any kind of altered state or any trance like state? Do you feel that the language that I'm using is that the hypnotic language of trance? Or am I just talking normally? Slightly over the top. <laughs> but right now your feet are stuck to the floor, your hand is stuck to your head, and that kind of doesn't make much sense, does it? No, I, I realise that it doesn't. Um, but tell you what, uh, look at me a second, look at me a second. Uh, so your name is in your, is in your mind right now, yes? Okay, I just want you to focus on where your name is in your mind. Focus on where your name is. Okay. And just for a moment, I want you to close your eyes so you can really visualize that. No big trance like stuff you'll open again in a second, but just visualize it nice and clearly. I want you to imagine that name moving into this hand. Imagine it leaving your head and moving into your hand. So there's nothing left behind. Really feel and see it into your hand. It goes all the way in, locks into the hand, leaves the head altogether. Nod your head when it's in the hand and no longer in your head. See it clearly, feel it. That's it. And we're going to take this hand now, and you can open your eyes. We're going to take this hand, and you can see it in your hand, just in your hand, but no longer in your head. We're just going to take that so it's completely out of sight and out of mind. So it's completely gone. And now it's completely gone. Try and say your name and find it's just gone. And the more you try, the more it just... It's like a cloud bursting. It's like a memory that you once had. And the more you try to reach for it, the further it goes. Try and say it, and just... It's like you kind of, you know the you know. Picture, I say. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Now if we took that picture away as well, and just allow that picture to evaporate into nothingness, so that has to come too. And it's like there's nothing at all left. It's weird, isn't it? But you can look at it again, so open your hand, open your hand, have a look at it, what is it? But if we were to then take that, put it out of sight and out of mind, so again it was completely gone, and the image vanished too. Try and say your name there. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. And we're just going to open your hand. Open your hand. We're going to put it back in. And your name is. It's back in your mind. You can see it clearly. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, 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 no. It's really simple. It's really simple. Imagine that you can remember your name. Mary. <laughs> no, just imagine, imagine you know what it is. Simple as that. And now you do know what it is. You can imagine it clearly, you can see it back where it belongs, so therefore your name is exactly. Because it's just your imagination. 
Oh, by the way, in exactly the same way that you can't lift your feet still, can you? You can't lift your feet. That's just a suggestion too. So I would just ask you to stop imagining that they're glued to the floor. Just stop imagining. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And if there's any, if there's any weird sort of after effects, which of course would be imaginary too, you could imagine that there aren't any. You can imagine that everything's normal and you feel absolutely fine. In fact, right now, you could imagine that you felt amazing. And if you want, if you want a trigger for that, give me your hand, give me your hand, give me your hand. I'm going to shake your hand twice, because that's all you'll need. The first time you'll feel this kind of rush of energy, like, like you've just done that, like in a, a, a great workout, yeah? And the second time, you'll just feel this wonderful sense of peace. Okay, you ready for this? So that's the first one. Can you feel that? It expands through you. That's it. And the second one, I'm just relaxing and feeling great. How's that feel? Really good? Nice. All the best. So, very, very quickly, I just want to explain the very brief outline of what that's about. Okay, very brief outline. So, uh, we'll keep it nice and simple. And uh, we'll go for the idea of uh, foot stuck to the floor. Alright? So, what we do is this. I ask him to imagine something, but I want him to think and feel it. I don't want him to just be up in his head, in his awareness, getting all tied up with what's and why's and wherefores. I want him to have an experiential moment. So I say to him, imagine that, you can, that it's stuck. Feel it getting stuck. And the only way that he can actually achieve that on a, on a feeling level is by pushing down. The moment he starts to push down, the body begins to mimic this sensation. In the same way that if I were to say, imagine your arm is being held up by a balloon. You could just passively do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm imagining a, a balloon. No, not really. Or I could really imagine a balloon was holding my arm up. And to do that, I would allow the weight to go out of my arm. I would soften everything. I would allow the muscle balance, all the sensations, to give me the illusion of my arm being held up. And it doesn't take long for my imagination to really conjure the sensation that my arm is floating. I'm no longer holding my arm up. My fingers maybe get slightly tingly, and yes, I know that's partly to do with the fact that the blood is just flowing back down my arm again. But even that sensation just feeds in to the illusion that my hand is being held up. I know what I'm doing, so I can stop. Okay. So here's the point. He feels and he knows that he's pushing down because he's creating the illusion of it being stuck. So he knows he's doing this. The only thing that needs to happen for this to turn into a phenomena of hypnosis is for the information that he's pushing down to stop coming up to his awareness. The moment he stops being aware that he's pushing down, but continues to push down, he now has that a foot step. Yes? Do you understand? That's what's going on. And it's no different than if you have a phobia. You have an automatic thing that you do, a, a, a behaviour that you exhibit, and you don't even know that you're doing it. And you confirm that belief over and over and over again. You always know if there's somebody with a spider phone in the room, because they'll tell you. They'll always tell you. Subject to spiders comes up, oh, I'm terrified of them. Well done, that was a suggestion and you believed it. So this is how we alter our realities every day. Um, I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of a, a, of a walk into my twisted mind, my wonderful world. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Okay, we're not going to let James go just yet. So we've got a green mic coming round. So. Uh,
front of you and just hold it nice and steady, point it at your mouth and everyone will be able to hear you. So does anyone have any, I think Victor, the, is it Victor at the back? Victor, yeah. Yeah, has a, has a first question. I, I wonder why this 16 year old, 16 stone rugby, rugby league player had given his um, male aggression over to you completely so easily. He never once seemed to confront his own arm doing that. Why would I do that? He never questioned you. Um, well, the, the reality is he, he gave consent. He gave consent by the very fact that he got up and walked to the front. Didn't have to, there was no coercion there. I acted as if it was a slightly, a slightly foregone conclusion. I just invited him up as if he was going to come. Why introduce the element of town when there was no need? I know what I'm going to do, and I know that he's in no danger in me doing it. So there's no lie on my part. I invited him up. He chose to stand up. And the very moment he chose to stand up, lots of those barriers crumble away immediately. Yeah, but he'd given up on his fight or flight, didn't he, completely for some reason? Uh, all right, so again, the, mis the misunderstanding here, and it's part of the illusion that I'm creating. Remember what I said earlier? Uh, the, and I used the, the, the context of magic, but we could flip into the context of, bit of uh, hypnosis. My job is not to hypnotize you. My job is to give you the ingredients to hypnotize yourself. I was not controlling him. I was inviting him to give up control to another part of himself. At the most, I'm tapping into something that he does every day, all day, effortlessly. And that is working on a level of uh, of happening rather than doing. I just asked him to imagine something to the extent that he felt like it was happening to him rather than he was doing it. But he did all of it. All of it. Now the framing of it is such a way that I want it to feel easy, effortless, non-confrontational. If I'd have worn the cloak of the Dark Lord, the I am the hypnotist, fear me, I dare say that him and most people in the room would have said, yes, sir, we're not doing that. Because it's the wrong context for that to happen. And I, I personally believe they're all the wrong context for that to happen. I, I, I dislike that style of hypnosis intensely because it's unnecessary and it also loses half the audience uh, straight away. But he gave consent, I made it easy, I hope that answers. Questions, so I'm rambling again. <laughs> <laughs> so, leading on from that, then, what makes it, some people, I mean, I didn't feel any of the heaviness or anything, my eyes were open straight away. Am I less open to suggestion than, no. I don't want to suggest that, being no, chatting no. is open to suggestion, but uh, is, is it that, or no. what is it then, so, that makes some people more private so than others? It's context more than anything else. Uh, and it's the narrative that you have yourself. So uh, there are a number of reasons why people don't respond to hypnosis, and it's kind of a multivariant equation, if you like. It's, it's more complicated than just one thing or two things. But most commonly, uh, one reason people don't is because they actually simply didn't understand the nature of the instructions. Remember what I said to you before, less about the input coming in and more about what's already there. So if you have a set of beliefs around, not specifically hypnosis, but around the sense of self, uh, if you're the kind of person that doesn't like the idea of somebody else controlling them, if you have a narrative going on inside you which is uh, one of strength and independence, and I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't do what other people tell me to do if you're a heterodox by nature, then that narrative is playing out. That's all that's going on. That narrative is just playing out. It doesn't make you less suggestible. It just makes you less suggestible in certain context. But the irony being is that you are you are responding to suggestion all day, every day, from a myriad of sources. It's just the ones that confirm your beliefs and feed into your narratives that you accept and others you reject. But the principle behind it is the same. So all we, we now have to do is, over a small amount of time, uh, uh, we have to find uh, we have to find a way of uh, altering the narrative, 
And maybe it's because of, there's, there's a need that's, that's, uh, that needs to be addressed. Maybe we need to just reframe it in such a way that your own narrative now, now works in conjunction with the suggestion that I give you. Now, in this environment, uh, you might just not like the idea of being that person. But if the conditions were different, your response would be different. Sorry, it's really virtually about the same thing that I, I, I'm a therapist and I have colleagues who work with hypnosis. I have never, I have not trained in it and so I've never experienced it and I thought this was a fantastic opportunity once you asked us what to do with our eyes to, to experience it. So I'm really keen for it to happen and it didn't. I, in a way, I didn't understand the instruction about what do you mean, imagine your eyes are heavy. Yeah, yeah precisely. Um, I Pre tried to, yeah. but nothing happened, and I was really disappointed. So, so precisely, precisely what I said, the, the, the most common reason is that simple sense of not quite understanding <coughs> what those instructions are. Now, in the time span that I had, which is why I said, I'm, I'm you know, running out of time, in my head I'm thinking I want to get to the Q&A, if you want to ask things, uh, that, that is the constraint. And I'm now just thinking, who, who understands this? Who already has enough of the right narrative in their, in their head, the right story in their head, uh, to respond? That's, that's literally what I'm doing that for. Uh, but, uh, so, I know, I know it's because you don't understand the instructions, which by your own account, that's largely going to be what it was about. Or, uh, and or, because it can be a mixture of course, uh, it because the context feels like it goes against a belief in that, which is what I said a moment ago, um, uh, which leads to the third part, which is just the idea that you are you're thinking more about what and why, you're analysing the moment more than doing the moment. Yeah? Analysis paralysis. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that in that moment, if you're thinking, like, is this working, what's going on, you know, etc., etc., that's actually taking you away from the experience itself. And the experience is about just sort of doing. So think about the idea of this. Do, do I have the capacity to imagine my eyes feeling heavy to the point where my eyelids shut? If any of you are saying no to that, then you've just overcomplicated something which is literally as simple as that. Yeah? Just that. Yeah? Feeling my eyes, just, just imagining and allowing it. Yeah? So change it slightly from imagine to pretend. Act. Think as if. Feel as if. Act as if. No difference. The imagination is an as if model. If, if, if it's anything, it's, it's an as if principle. That, the, that you've got layers of imagination, you've got that kind of just contextual thing where I just think of something, but I'm not really involved in it. And then there are other things that I imagine which I have a deep, resonant feeling about, and all points in between. And I'm simply asking you to take something which is just this idea of imagine, but give it that, give it that as if. Yeah? Imagine your eyes feeling heavy, think as if they are getting heavy, feel as if they're getting heavy, and act as if they're getting heavy. And the answer to that is you go, no different than, uh, you, know, you know, just pretend that you, you can't lift your arm. It's not hard to just go, I can't lift it. And you, there's, there's degrees of how active I am in, in that experience. And the thing that gets in my way more than anything else, and it's the thing that gets in the way in life generally, and that is a contrary belief. And the contrary belief is often simply a case of can't. The irony, by the way, of the belief I can't getting in the way of you achieving something, and that is precisely the suggestion I gave you. So if any of you thought, I can't do this, that was a suggestion I wanted you to accept. I just didn't want you to accept it about the context. I wanted you to accept it about one element of the context, which was not being able to open your eyes. Yeah? 
If it doesn't, if I, I, we can chat. Yeah, what I'm interested was um, it's much harder to imagine my name than it was. I think I think you have to think more. It's a lot easier. It's a difference in like like sensory perception. So because I'm using my eyes rather than like moving my feet sort of thing. Is there a difference there in what I can do? Yeah. So like stop myself. Yeah. So idiomotia is always going to be significantly easier uh, to achieve than something which is. Uh, which has the deep resonance of meaning ultimately. You know, the idea the idea of not being able to lift your foot is fairly abstract and it's just a it's basically an idiomotor response, largely it's a cataleptic sensation, it's nothingness. But forget your own name, well that comes with that comes with a, a resonance of meaning, a, a sense of identity and, and there's a, the, there is potentially the threat uh, connected to it. Some people struggle some people can do all sorts of wonderful things with hypnosis. But things like name amnesia are a struggle. Number amnesia is a problem, happy to let go of a number. Um, and the effect for that would be if you, if you got somebody to imagine that number three didn't exist and count their fingers, they'd go one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And they'd be all confused because they already know they have ten, but now they've counted eleven. Uh, it's very amusing. Uh, but yeah, name, names. But flip that round, I, I hypnotized a mathematician um, not that long ago in a show. And could she let go of the number? Not I hope it help. They were too important to her. Okay. okay, so can you hand it to Paul that's in front of you? Thanks. One question would be, where does body aware, people who are more body aware come into this? What effect would body awareness have on your results? Explain what you mean, sorry. Well, some people are not body aware at all. Some people who practice maybe meditation and that sort of thing are very aware of every element of it. They're sat here and they can feel their toes and their, their circulation almost moving all the time. And they're very aware of what their mind is doing to their body all the time. Um, <coughs> The, the truth of the matter is, it, it's, it's, always about, it's always about the person and my tuning. The, the, the thing I have against conventional uh, hypnotherapy, uh, and I work in the industry and I, I teach in the industry, uh, so the thing I have against hypnotherapy in that conventional sense is, is that it's often taught as a one-size-fits-all. So people go and they learn an induction or they learn a, a script for a particular therapeutic protocol. Um, and, and you're dealing with human beings. And, that, and the biggest tool of, of any therapist is, is observancy. observancy. Uh, being observant is the ability to actually get to know the person, to, to fine-tune everything, to be attentive. Yeah? Um, so my feeling would be that I'm, I'm just aware I'm, I'm, I'd be attentive, and I'd steer them in whatever, and again, it's back to this idea of if I can, if I can feed into their, their, their pre-existing narratives, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is gonna work a treat. Yeah? So how do you explain a situation like my youngest daughter was an absolutely avid smoker for many, many years? And eventually, at my suggestion, she saw a, hypno, a hypnotist. Her. Now, smoking is nicotine addiction, yeah? Okay, so it's a bodily function. She spent three hours with a hypnotist and can't stand being anywhere near a cigarette or smoke, and she stopped instantly. Yeah. So how does that mentality overcome a, a body addiction, which is a chemical thing, surely? Um, because uh, addiction is... Uh, addiction is... Uh, about... <coughs> addiction is a community problem, not a chemical problem. So addiction is a community problem, not a chemical problem. Uh, the chemical side of addiction is far less vital or valid even than the, uh, uh, the, the, the reasoning, the way
whatever reasoning. And when I say reasoning, I don't mean in the sense of reason, uh, in that empirical way, I mean in the sense of the illusion of reason that we have. So, what hypnotherapy can do and does do, uh, and is incredibly effective at doing, is it gives the person, not everybody, but some people fight it, but for those who are, who are open to it, uh, they are allowing, they're allowing an, an, an external source to remap their thinking, because that's what it does. It's about, um, it has a lot to do with the placebo and the nocebo effect. It has a lot to do with the therapeutic relationship. If you've gone seen other hypnotists or hypnotherapists, it might have had a different outcome. There might have just been something right about all the ingredients that came into that moment. Um, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Uh, but you know, the, the, the point is that your, your reality, your very, your very view of the world around you and how you interact with it, it is all based on the stories that you tell yourself and the stories that you that, that you re-strengthen and, and the experiences that you have uh, and they're all they're all illusions ultimately yeah so sometimes sometimes you just write for that moment for somebody to say one thing to you that changes your life uh, because it hits you at the right time i, I realize that's quite a woolly answer but it was the best way to come up with Okay, should we go to Sally? Sally, if you were the microphone as well, thank you. Um, it's not really a question, it's just an addition to um, the, the explanations you were given about um, how it worked on some people and didn't on others. But that I've got something different again. I, I thought I'd, I'd give it a go and I sort of trusted you not to do anything. Um, to unpleasant as, as it were, and I, um, and I felt to my great surprise, because I didn't think I would, it would work very well on me, but I, to my great surprise I felt my eyelids going very heavy, remarkably quickly, and it panicked me, not because of, of the loss of control, but because I thought I, I do not want to feel the sensation of not being able to open my eyes, and I pulled myself out of it, um, yeah. but I was amazed how how quickly I felt this, this heaviness. But that, as I say, it only scared me at just at the thought that I wouldn't be able to see. That's a very common experience. Mm. Very common experience. Mm. Yeah, I had the same Thank thing, Sally. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, first of all, thanks very much, James. Very entertaining, as always. Um, Last year, beginning of the year, uh, I had to go to the hospital unexpectedly and the only bed they had available was in the, um, the geriatric dementia ward. Right? And, um, yeah, the, the, no comments, thank you very much. And um, one of the things I noticed was that the, the patients in there, obviously their realities were very different to our normal perception, whatever that means. Uh, and I noticed that the nurses um, didn't challenge their realities at all. When they were communicating, they actually aligned their realities to the patient's realities, and that was the only way that they built those bridges. Now, you mentioned that you'd worked in mental health nursing way, way, way back, and I'm just wondering if that so proceeds for what we're talking about this evening, because you're talking about, uh, to a degree, alignment of realities or reinforcing realities, uh, and I just wondered if you had any observations on that. Good question. Uh, so. There's that, there's that old um, story of the, the guy driving down um, and, you know, a road in the countryside. And he's a bit lost and he, he pulls up next to a, a local who's you know, sat chewing an ear of corn on, on, the, uh, on the fence. And he says, how do I get to X town? And the guy looks up and he says, oh, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> I think that it is important that we uh, we start our journey from where we are rather than where we want to be. Uh, but it's also important that we, uh, if we are uh, lucky enough, honoured enough to assist somebody else on their journey, that we start the journey from where they are. 
with a, with a huge amount of acceptance. Um, and when I say acceptance, I don't mean that kind of, you know, oh, I'll let you on that level of acceptance, but a true sense of, of accepting uh, who they are and where they are. However, we also have to be very cautious in recognizing uh, the, uh, the cognitive illusions that exist in all of us. And if you do nothing but confirm the illusion that somebody has, or the delusion that somebody has, it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, which is an interesting thing where we are socially at the moment in the world. Uh, if anybody has done CBT training in any way, uh, cognitive distortions, uh, there's quite a few of them that we suffer from. Um, and one of the big cognitive distortions of the, the, the time that we live in is the, the, the distortion of always trust your feelings. And the society that we now live in is, is, is constantly telling everybody to always trust their feelings, that their feelings are more important than facts or evidence. Uh, that's a very dangerous place to be. So I think we do have a responsibility to absolutely begin a journey with somebody where they are, but also to teach them how to question the perception of where they are. So, uh, sorry, I was referring particularly to you and your journey, and I wondered whether the fact that you had worked in mental health nursing uh, had actually influenced maybe your journey to where you are now. It, it gave me it gave me my love of the human mind, and okay. ultimately That's fine. That, that was that was the start. Of it, so. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> So much, really enjoyed that. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, just to point to me that, um, do you consider that hypnosis could be an extremely powerful tool to assist an individual to achieve all sorts of things that they think that they couldn't? just by looking at perceptions of themselves and their abilities? Um, yes, it could be, and I stress the word could. Uh, the current problem that we have, and thankfully there are some, so there's, there's, there's people doing some uh, astonishing great work in this field, as we speak. Uh, right, right here in Bournemouth, uh, we have uh, Adam Eason and uh, uh, Dr. Ben Parrish, working up at the university, uh, doing some, some incredible uh, studies, clinical studies in hypnosis uh, and therapy. Um, but the reason I say could, and that is, it, it could be immensely beneficial if we could keep it on a, an evidence-based level. The problem is we have to drag it kicking and screaming from a from a different place altogether. And it's still unfortunately wrapped up in, uh, in theatrics and mysticism and, and, and beliefs which are absolute bullshit. I mean, absolute, like mind numbingly makes me angry crap. I went to a conference uh, end of last year and somebody was doing a particular therapy. I won't say what the therapy is. Uh, just in case you've heard of EFT. Um, <laughs> and a demonstration that was given to prove that EFT was working was this. And I'm not kidding you, this was the demonstration. So everybody, everybody got to stand up and the, and, the, and the instructor said, bend down and see how close to your toes you can get. Now stand up and go through the protocol of tapping and chanting. Now bend down and see how much further you go. Stand up, go through the protocol of chanting and tapping, and now bend down and see how much further you go. Notice on each of those occasions I didn't do the chanting or the tapping, yet I still went further each time. And unfortunately, that is the level that some of these things are at. Now I'm not saying that EFT and other such therapies don't have a benefit, I'm just simply saying that the reason for the benefit might not be the one that they're saying it is. 
And if we learn about uh, nocebo and placebo, the more we learn about nocebo and, and, and placebo, uh, that, that really is one of the major areas uh, of growth in research that we need to focus on. And if we do, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Yeah. Jane, can you just remind us what nocebo means? I forgot. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so it, it's literally the opposite. So placebo is the positive effect of a suggestion, essentially, and nocebo is the, is the negative effect. Uh, it's a, it's a, a practical adaptation which, we, which you see a lot in hospitals. In the, in the old days, when we, when, remember when you had the chart at the bottom of your bed? Uh, and the doctor would come in, pick the chart up and go, and you'd feel worse. <laughs> what you didn't realise was that the reason he went, oh, is he was at hour 16 of a 24 hour shift, and he hadn't eaten. Yeah? So the nocebo effect is, the, is, is literally opposite of the placebo, it's incredibly powerful. That's the type of way. I was wondering, uh, I was wondering what kind of reframing, reframing did you do or try to do in your own life? Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know what? Not not as much as I should, without a doubt. Uh, but I am. Uh, Less lucky, whatever word you want to to uh, to, to, to do that, uh, because I've got uh, lots of friends that that make me question things that I wouldn't otherwise. I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm very aware of, of not living in a thought bubble. That that I want to surround myself with people who I vehemently disagree with more than people who will hand into my ego. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the truth is, what I believe about lots of things today is radically different to what I believed five years ago, including about myself. And uh, if you meet me in another five years, I hope that I've changed my mind again. Yeah. Um, were all of your explanations of what you were doing bullshit? Or <laughs> 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 some of them were your best um, All the explanations of the hypnosis were honest. They are, they are the uh, they are the simplified best understanding, but not the complete picture by any stretch. Well, we've had some amazing talks at Dorset Humanists over the years. I think tonight has been one of the most entertaining and one of the most um, thought-provoking and uh, slightly alarming as well, because I had exactly the same experience as Sally. So, uh, would you please give a, a huge round of applause?